Welcome everyone. Um, you've joined uh, the SIPS ANZ webinar, Squiz, Procurement in a Connected Commerce World. Um, we're just going to wait for a few others to join us, but while you're coming on, um, let's get chatting. Why don't you um, tell us uh, where you're from on the chat box? So just make sure you get panellists and all attendees. Um, let's get chatting amongst each other. I'm here in Melbourne in lockdown. Um, a bit windy outside. Now in, settle in and we'll um, start very shortly. So you've come to the right place. The webinar for today is Squiz Procurement in a Connected Commerce World. Got some people already saying hello. Make sure you uh, use panellists and attendees when you say hello to everyone. Well, welcome everybody. Great to have you for our webinar and at SIPS ANZ webinar entitled Squiz, Procurement in a Connected Commerce World. Um, I'd like to advise everyone before we start that this webinar is currently being recorded and it, it's being recorded because there'll be a copy available to you next week. But first, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri, Woi, Wurrung and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians of the lands on which I present from today, and we pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands people today. In addition to our New Zealand colleagues and friends, Tina Koko, Tina Koko, Tina Koko, Katawa. Welcome. We have about 150 registered attendees today, and that's people from all over the regions and further afield. My name is Sharon Morris, and I'm really delighted to be welcoming and representing the professional body as General Manager for SIPS Australia and New Zealand. So a warm welcome to everyone. For those of you who don't know who we are, SIPS, the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply, we're a global professional body for procurement and supply professionals. And we're dedicated to promoting best practice and continuous improvement in professional standards. And we're also dedicated to raising awareness of the contribution that procurement and supply management can make to organisations and really the community at large. Uh, we're here to support you, procurement professionals, through your procurement prof professional journey. And with that support comes knowledge. And today's webinar is just one way that we're sharing knowledge. But SIPS is also your gateway to connect connections and to networking, really being part of a procurement community. And more now than ever, do we need to remain connected? So what I encourage you is to continue the conversations through the chat bar here, but also through our um, SIPS LinkedIn groups. And why not seek out our branch events um, on our website? and potentially become a member. So again, welcome to today's webinar, which is sponsored by Squiz.com. I love that, Squiz, have a Squiz, great name. And the topic is procurement in the connected commerce world. This webinar will take a very unique look at how a connected business network can empower the role of procurement in an environment where remote work and virtually virtual connectivity are becoming the new normal. But before we start, let's do a bit of Zoom keeping. All attendees, you've all been muted during the presentation. However, please, as I keep saying, use the chat box. We want to make this as interactive as possible. And don't forget to pick up all panellists and all attendees when you um, use the drop down box to chat to everybody. And we're also here to answer any of your questions. Well, not me, but the squiz.com team. So if you have any specific questions you may wish to um, have addressed, then please enter them in the Q&A box, not the chat box, the Q&A box, and we'll address those directly after today's presentation. So let's get started. Allow me to introduce our speaker for today. His name is Glenn Drew, and he's a passionate and committed CEO of squiz.com. A thought leader who thrives on bringing game-changing dreams to life to create new realities for others to step into and discover. Squiz.com is a revolutionary cloud-based supply chain connected commerce platform where organisations and people can connect with each other inside a secure framework. 
Over to you, Glenn. Thank you, Sharon. Um, really appreciate that introduction. And it's such an honor to be invited by SIPS to present to you all today. And um, uh, we've got a fair bit of uh, awesome content. So I'm going to just, uh, just launch straight into it. And, um, you know, I look forward to the Q&A session that follows from this. And I invite you to really think broadly about uh, the topics that we're going to cover today and, uh, and apply them into your own world. So um, let's get into it. First of all, um, just a little bit about us. Our purpose is to enrich the world through the circles of connections you trust. And uh, there's, that's, that's a really important statement to us. Um, and you'll understand more about that message as we progress. Our mission is to connect everyone through universally trusted environments and empower individuals and organizations to absolutely unlock their potential. So talking about unlocking potential, let's have a look at uh, my world. And I wanna introduce you into um, just what uh, my world looks like as a fraction, you know, this, if I tried to do this holistically, I'd be here for an hour, but there's me. And, um, and I am married to a beautiful, lovely woman called Anna. And I'm, I have, I have three brothers, but um, Rowan is one of my brothers that I work with. And I'm also um, a member of different things. I, I'm a member of a ski lodge uh, in Victoria. So where I'm based uh, just Northeast of Melbourne, I'm lucky to live on a rural property outside the lockdown zone. Um, and, uh, and I'm also a member of the Essendon Football Club, so don't hold me to that uh, or, or not. Hopefully, uh, hopefully there's some Essendon fans out there. Um, and I'm also a trustee of, of course, my self-managed super fund. So that's kind of my, a little snippet of my personal world. Then um, the game gets more interesting because naturally I'm the CEO of two companies, um, Squeeze and Totex. And then our companies have clients or customers that we deal with and interact with every day. And one such client is a company called Holyoke Industries. And Holyoke is a manufacturer of uh, air, air management solutions in the construction building industry. Um, every time you see sort of a vent in a roof, uh, you're most likely looking at a Holyoke product. Um, now I'm, I'm connected to their, their national sales manager, um, who's also a friend of mine, Andrew Craig. And um, then Holyoke themselves, they sell into the construction industry through uh, um, effectively mechanical services industry, which is, um, you know, some of their clients would be AG Coombs and all staff. And uh, they in turn buy off, uh, race plumbing to get supplies and ultimately they deliver to the builders of the world and uh, and build buildings. Now you'll notice that there's um, some tiles, uh, some sort of uh, uh, borders around these areas and and you can kind of see that these companies operate in their own marketplaces and um, we've just defined a couple broadly, you know, the mechanical service market, marketplace and the builder's marketplace. Um, but Holyoke also order safety gear for their manufacturing plants. Um, and, you know, a potential company like that is SafeMan uh, and they sell into the safety and PPE marketplace. So from this very limited snippet into my world, you can kind of see how uh, my relationship to different entities, organization and people um, uh, are all quite diverse and, and uh, there's different uh, types of relationships in play between customers and suppliers um, and even service providers such as Smart Freight. So for instance, Holyoke and SafeMan may use Smart Freight to, to, to route their orders out. Um, so that's, that's a snippet of my world. Now, why is that really interesting? Well, before we get into that, um, I want to just say that to make my world work, uh, I just use a bucket load of digital tools. And uh, the next slide um, is some of the, or quite a lot of the tools that I use. So every day I've got lots of logins and passwords and, and I'm in lots of different systems to make my connected world work. And uh, sometimes it can be a bit frustrating. So first of all, 
why don't we jump into the first poll question because I'd like you to have a think about your connected world and and the digital tools that you've got in play and and this poll question is really about um, you know uh, don't try to you know fret about making sure it's completely comprehensive but just put down a guide of how many tools do you log into every day to get your work done now um, some some thinking around that uh, it, just think about uh, not only software, but think about apps and um, what you go into the browser to use. So you're logging into in-browser uh, applications. And hopefully when you've done this, you can kind of see that, um, you know, there's quite a few tools that you're using. And that's quite, that's quite an interesting result. You know, three to eight, eight to 15, that's, this, that's the kind of the common element. That's a fair bit of logging in going on. Okay. Moving into the next slide. So in one sense, the liber in the internet liberated us from the shackles of the manual world. I'm going to cover that. I'm sort of, sort of going to explain why that's really important, but also we're also shackled now to the digital world and there's some, uh, there's some, impacts of that and you know those statistics of how many systems do you log into um, is is probably testament to just you know we are now shackled to computers and stuff like that so um, I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey and we're going to have a look at how we've evolved through online commerce and what the current state of play is and then how we're heading towards a new paradigm we call it connected commerce and uh, and what that what that will mean for the future. So that's the nature of this presentation and the flow. All right, so let's look at the evolution of online commerce. And let's start with me as a 19 year old. So that was, uh, I'm happy to let you know that I'm 40 years old. So that was 21 years ago. And I was uh, studying at Melbourne University at uh, computer science engineering, and I was working on the side doing some IT consulting work. And I came across a client and they, they are in the office products industry. And they said, we want to sell to our customers um, online. And I said, okay, great. Well, how do you sell right now? And they showed me how they do it. They have a showroom, they have an over the counter sales and they have a, um, a workflow that they went through and, um, Something just struck me. Uh, next slide, thanks, Dan. Um, something that struck me that when I was actually watching, uh, it's funny when you when you're 19 years old, you have a lot more time. Um, I was watching how the customer interacted with the business, and I was like, well, this manual buying and selling is is great, and and there's a lot of personal attention and that that personal uh, knowledge that the uh, salesperson had was really helpful for the customer. But I said to the business, how do you actually grow and scale this? And they said, well, we, we scale because the next stage of commerce is, um, is where we are at, which is ba message based ordering commerce. And this is where uh, in a separate part of their office, they had another person or a, a bunch of people that were um, taking fax orders and email orders and then rekeying that there's lots of, lots of um, people on the phone. And, um, and we call this message based ordering. So the challenge with message-based ordering is it's very manual still, and uh, it still it ties uh, customer service people to their phone. So this particular client said, we want to get out of this. Uh, well, not get out of it, but we want to really streamline this. And uh, can we offer an e-commerce website that, that can do that work? And so we then went into the next stage, uh, the next level, which is where I came in. And I said, all right, I can build you an e-commerce website. And I grabbed some off the shelf software and I said, okay, here we, here we go, it's, it's working. And they came back to me and said, no, it's actually not working because our customers can't see the, the right price. And I said, oh, okay, that's interesting. And the, the answer was that all the pricing lived inside the business software of that company. And I was like, okay, well, we need to get that pricing online. So that started my journey in e-commerce and we built a separate company called totex.com and you know the workflow for totex uh, you know it's still 20 years on this this company's thriving and, and it's working really well um, suppliers send e newsletters these days there's no sort of mail outs anymore or sometimes there is with printed catalogs um, customers log in browse add to cart 
the internet order can be held in some instances and, um, and that order can be uh, sent to someone to approve that order on the client side as an email. And then the client will log in and, um, or click on a, a, an accept button. And then that will post the internet order to the supplier. Now the web order is, is a great um, workflow for the supplier because it actually cuts out a lot of that manual work and allows the supplier to scale. Um, however, uh, even so, what we noticed is that there's certain customers that wouldn't do it that way. They still prefer sending emails and faxing orders through. And by the 2005, 2006, one of our biggest clients then had hit $100 million of online sales a year. So that was a really big feat. But that was only about 30% of their overall turnover. And um, we went and had a meeting with them. We said, well, why, why is that uh, the case? Like, why isn't the other 70% of clients ordering through your website? And they literally said, um, the issue we have is that the customer needs a purchase order in their own system so that they'll just key that purchase order in and push it through. Um, some customers, and this is for most suppliers, some customers have a higher level of sophistication. Um, and in, in fact, some customers like the big corporates in, uh, will mandate that the, that the suppliers have to accept EDI orders. So that's level four. Level four is um, what we call uh, e-commerce punch out coupled with electronic data interchange. Now, um, what does this mean? Well, it, if we click into the workflow, Daniel. Okay, so with punch out, what happens is the customer hooks up their system to the supplier's online store and they'll punch out into that online store and uh, complete a shopping cart, submit that order, and then the online store will punch back a what's called an order requisition. And that order requisition lands in the customer's system and then the customer goes through a, a, an approval process. So we've built some punch out uh, EDI scenarios in our Totex platform and uh, they work quite okay, but they're very expensive to implement. They take a lot of time and the IT teams on both sides still have to work together. Now in the fullest uh, implementation of punch out is once that requisition's approved, the purchase order goes back to the supplier and that's imported into their system. And usually that link between where the PO is posted and it's received, it's not a live link often, it's just drop a file onto the supplier's computer somewhere and then it sucks it in. Um, so if there's any errors or problems, then this is kind of, this EDI process starts to break down. In some cases, companies have worked with uh, middleware parties, um, that are like vans or value added networks and they integrate to the vans, um, but still largely with EDI, the customers dictate to the suppliers how the, um, the electronic documents have to work. Now, once the suppliers receive that order, then they pick pack and, and send an electronic invoice and post it back to the customer. And then the customer eventually pays and then you post the remittance back. That's the full EDI process. Um, okay, so if we're going to now, um, the next stage of this is what we call connected commerce. And there's a massive leap here uh, that is available for industry in connected commerce. And the major leap is that uh, we have an end-to-end -end trusted relationship. That's where um, the entities, the organization entities can hook up really fast and create a connected relationship. And then we have a universal structure so that uh, systems can be universally linked in to a connected commerce platform. Now that will then alter the workflow. So let's go into the workflow of connected commerce and see um, an example of how this works. Now this kind of looks a little bit uh, intimidating, but it's actually quite um, smart. So first of all, the suppliers, instead of sending e-newsletters, they will actually send feed notifications and customers can subscribe to feeds of interest um, such as, you know, a sale, a, a particular category. So we're one, of the, one of our clients um, might be in the safety game. So, so they might set up a PPE sales feed and people will, will follow that feed to get any um, information about what's coming up in terms of deals. Um, when they have created, um, uh, you know, when they've selected what they wanted to buy or, or they're ready to go and have a browse, 
The issue with the supplier's shopping cart website is it means that the customer still can't get a PO back into their system. So in this particular workflow, the goal is that the customer can actually log into a connected commerce platform, add to basket for multiple suppliers. So now the shopping basket breaks out and you can have multiple baskets. Um, that uh, when you post that order through, the order is validated and it can be validated against what the supplier and customers agree at a relationship level. So in terms of validation, it could be that, you know, the supplier insists that it's, uh, that it's got GS1 accredited barcodes um, or other data that, that is to be posted with it. And the reason this is so important is that we now have a new icon here. It's not just a person that can initiate this. A system on the customer's end could initiate this. So the system can download the product catalog. It can download the price list and then it can create an order and not just in platform, but it can push an order through the universal APIs and send it to the supplier. The supplier side, it, rather than it landing at the supplier and the supplier getting the order and there's some problems, uh, the connected commerce platform validates that order in real time and, and says back to the customer, I'm sorry, can't send that order through. We can't accept that because there's pricing doesn't line up, maybe some stock rules, this will trigger a back order or whatever. So this will increase the, um, the efficiency uh, massively because that level of uh, catalog level communication is virtually real time. Now, once the customer submitted the order, um, the universal workflow is based on a, a key concept of connect once and trade with everyone connected. So rather than having to do integrations with different customers and supplier systems, which is very complicated, the, um, the advantage of a connected commerce platform is you connect your system in and then the UDI, the universal data interchange takes over from EDI and it actually allows all the document exchange to flow exactly like EDI does. So with connected commerce, there's this new paradigm shift of the shopping basket. So the basket is now uh, a, new, a new broader concept. So let's get into that. Okay, so we're sort of familiar with having to go to lots of different supply websites to buy the things we want to buy. And we would go and then add to cart and, add, and log in and add to cart. And, you know, it was interesting that some of those people in that, that poll said, um, you know, they use more than say 20 systems. Well, if you're a purchasing manager, you would be definitely using more than 20 systems per day. You'll be logging into lots of suppliers websites. And the snag with this process is lots of usernames, lots of passwords, lots of carts, lots of different things in different places. So in a connected commerce world, there's one environment that you can create a cart and you can add multiple products for different suppliers to a cart. So the shopping basket becomes uh, more capable. It could be a project based shopping basket and labeled that way. Um, or it could be a basket that is uh, for, you know, a weekly order from lots of different suppliers. And the connected commerce platform has to then split that basket when you post the orders and then manage all of the, uh, the, order, the electronic document exchange. But another thing that makes connected commerce more powerful is because if my network, as we started out, is bolted into my world, then I can share my shopping baskets with other people that I work with in my personal world. And this creates a huge amount of power um, of, of ordering from a sort of common platform. All right, so poll question number two, have a look at your business and what level do you think your business is operating at? And, you know, um, I'd say that most people would have e-commerce websites by now. Uh, and if you don't, if your business is, you know, if you're a customer business, um, naturally you still sell to your customers, but if you're a service-based business, you might not have an e-commerce website and you still do level one and two, and that's fine. It's really just to sort of see where, uh, where industry is at. Now, um, you'll find that with EDI, uh, most only large procurement sort of suppliers and operation and customers will go to that level, but it's become a lot more commonplace, particularly in the last five years. So, yeah, that's sort of a statistic that I was expecting to see, uh, about 30, 32% um, at the level of e-commerce and then 15% in EDI. And uh, it's good to see that there's some organizations that are getting into the connected commerce thinking. Okay. 
All right, so let's kind of look at, let's have a brief look at the current state of play. Um, now, the COVID situation uh, is slowing the world economy in some way. We don't know if it's temporary or it's going to be long. There's, there's mixed messages coming through media, but it's certainly having an impact. There's no doubt about that. Uh, we've seen a massive increase in online technologies. Uh, that's because of the lockdowns and the, um, you know, the, the, the fact that ordering physically is actually really difficult um, when lockdowns are occurring, and particularly here in Victoria, that's a major issue. Um, international supply chains have been stretched. I've, I've sort of, I'm, I'm getting intel now saying that, you know, orders from China are starting to return back to more normal scheduling and turnaround. So that's, that's sort of positive to hear. But there've been a lot of issues around getting stock into, in through ports and customs and stuff like that. Um, local supply chains are under some level of press, pressure. And there's, I guess there's two things going on. There's the finding of stock, of course, but also managing all the COVID restrictions. Uh, in Victoria, it's pretty, hard, pretty you know, hard to, to sort of make that work. And I'm, I have no doubt there's a lot of organizations that are doing a brilliant job with it. Um, but that's going to, that's sort of slowing things down. And, uh, and also then there's a consumer shift to buying online. So then that opens up uh, the challenge for distributors to, well, if I can't sell through my traditional channels, I now need to start looking at consumer channels. And this was a trend that was pre COVID, but it's starting to really accelerate where distributors are really starting to think, think a little bit more outside the box. And definitely some of our clients are selling on eBay and Amazon and they are, you know, used to be pure play wholesale distributors. All right. So, but let's, let's kind of look at some of the e-commerce data that we can, we can show you. Um, we had a look at a pool of clients that had 150K or less of, of online monthly sales. And what we were interested in is what percentage of the user base or the, of, of the customer accounts are actually logging into an online e-commerce or logging into the suppliers e-commerce website. And what, uh, what percentage of those are actually placing orders. So you can see here that, um, you know, 27% uh, of uh, the um, customers were logging into a supplier's website, but only 11.6% were actually placing orders online. So there's really, it highlights a gap that customers still prefer manual or message-based commerce, which is really interesting. And this, the next slide takes this up a notch and we go and look at uh, a couple of more brackets. Now, the, don't get too buried in the data, but really just the, the, the key trend here is very much that, that the light blue is saying to us that there's a lot of customers that there's a lot of customer accounts that are really not logging in and ordering online and um, it's growing, but this is a straw poll of, of real, you know, real businesses. And some of them have done some exceptional work in pushing their websites, but you can really only see that 30%, maybe 40% uh, in the companies over a million dollars. And this is a million dollars a month of, of, of turnover, online turnover. Um, you know, one customer has, you know, nearly 90% of their clients are logging in, but only about 50% are ordering. So this light blue area is the bit that by 2006, I already could see through talking to our clients, the big gap here. And, and, you know, how do we solve this gap? How do we fix, the, fix this so that uh, suppliers can get virtually full automation, but also customers can get access to the data and the catalog information in real time. Um, so that, that kind of emerged back then. And we thought, well, maybe there's something in this. And this is, um, this is sort of the evolution of 15 years of work. Okay. So the holy grail for any supplier is that they don't manually process anything. Um, and the holy grail is, is because it, ultimately it's a complete live demand based procurement methodology. Um, the our orders are always accurate. Uh, the customer gets exactly what they want and when they want it. And there's the delays and mistakes are virtually eliminated. What we're saying here is that e-commerce has grown, but it won't, it won't grow beyond, you know, around 30, 30, 40% of online trend of the total transactions, direct EDI hard to implement really complicated. Our view is connected commerce will start creeping in and working its way from the, the sort of the top clients and working its way down into uh, broadly uh, small businesses that, you know, are running small platforms like Myob and zero and things like that. All right. 
So there's another paradigm shift that's happening. This is probably the big thing that we're all talking about. Um, I'm giving, I'm going to give it a label. Feel free to take the label. Feel free to comment and talk about it. We call this the anywhere shift is the new normal. If you're, if you're, if you're coming from home right now, you're participating already in what I term as the anywhere economy. And it's because it, anywhere is more broader than just work from home. Anywhere is actually far more advanced than that. And it, it takes in ideas and concepts like industrial 4.0, localized manufacturing. Um, it takes into concepts like smart cities and, um, you know, localization, distributed, um, distributed offices. So rather than us all piled into the CBD, we're all working from, you know, not just home, but cafes or other, other purpose-built localized environments. Um, and it's, it covers a, across a range of all of our activities. It's not just one or two activities that we, we want this anywhere liberty. So we call this the anywhere economy. The COVID thing has accelerated it, but it was already starting to transition prior to that. And just so, just for complete disclosure, we, we actually uh, closed our office in March. Uh, we were lucky we weren't in a long-term lease and our company was already running pretty much inside this concept. And, um, you know, we will have a new office uh, in the coming months, but it's going to be more of focused around meeting and collaboration, less focused around people anchored to desks. Okay, so anywhere economy is, is coming. Um, to underpin the anywhere economy, particularly in procurement, um, connected commerce fits beautifully. So we, we're gonna be heading towards connected commerce. And what does that actually mean? Well, the values of technology have changed. Uh, we've seen enough uh, broad media about just the hacking that goes on in major platforms, uh, Twitter and Facebook and so on. We've also talked about issues around, well, we've seen issues around copyright and you know, do you own your content really? Um, the, the ad revenue model is sort of a, just a, you know, kind of really getting to its limits. We're, we're looking for now privacy, security, and particularly with our businesses and bringing our business systems into this, we definitely have to have a trusted uh, environment and space. And then all of these great technologies, there's heaps of them out there, they wrap around this new set of values and we call this ultimately connected commerce. Okay, so for connected commerce to work, uh, what do we need? Well, we, first of all, we need product catalogs. So that's, in, that's by implication. That, but we also need to redesign the way the internet and the way our relationships work on the internet. And we need a much more trusted and secure environment. We, we need universal data interchange that, you know, having to bolt systems together directly is, is convoluted and expensive. And in fact, it's very impractical. But this is the probably the, the hidden the hidden gem. Procurement intelligence is, is, uh, is such a, um, this is where the bulk majority of future value for distribution and supply chain is when a business re-gears themselves to procurement intelligence. Um, let's have a look at what these three actually mean. Okay, so let's start with the internet of relationships. We're all connected, as you saw with my example. We work for organizations. Those organizations have lots of systems. Those organizations cluster also into bigger, broader concepts, and we call that marketplaces. Now, this, is, this word marketplace has been skewed because Facebook marketplace and Amazon marketplace and all that. Our view of a marketplace is a cluster of businesses that are aligned in some way uh, to, to get things done. And it doesn't have to be businesses. It could be other organizations. Like you could have a marketplace for uh, Victorian local councils, or you can have a marketplace for, um, you know, for hobby craft and hobby uh, interests. Um, but the broad concept of a marketplace is a bunch of organizations and people all bolted into um, this, this higher structure. Then people naturally, we're all friends, we're all connected with each other. So we've all got professional relationships in play. And, you know, we, we want um, to be able to communicate wearing the hat relevant to the communication rather than just posting a text. I want to post it as CEO of Squeeze or, or CEO of Todex or whatever. Um, now that's the internet relationships. So we need a secure framework to build this. Um, the next part is universal data interchange. We need all these systems, and this is only a microcosm of systems, all these systems to be able to participate in a common framework. 
And so uh, a lot of our work has actually been preparing this concept of universal data interchange. Now, this is actually really tricky to achieve. And the reason it's tricky is the way we price things at different units of measure and the way we store that data against our product catalogs. So one of the big projects that we did over the last 15 years was design a, a way that every price for every customer and every product can be mapped in a highly efficient um, algorithm so that we can literally search across the our connected world and find the pricing and product information that's relevant to our connected relationships. So UDI is not just integrating systems in a universal way, but it is also these broader concepts of universal uh, representation of pricing and stock and uh, units of measure across a, a market. All right. Um, in that previous slide, you'll notice there's smart freight there. One of the connected services that is vital to uh, to connected commerce is is something like a smart freight, where they aggregate freight carriers across uh, you know hundreds of different freight providers, and they allow their customers to set up all their different freight accounts. But smart freight then works out what is the best possible way to get this parcel to the other end. And it's very imp impressive technology. We've worked with them for many years and, um, and it's great to have Ben as one of our Q&A panelists. Um, now, on the final part, procurement bottlenecks is, uh, this, is this is really the procurement intelligent piece. There's a lot, still a lot of businesses that have people tied up on phone calls that are resolving questions and answers where the customer can actually get the answers they want. So the clients that we've noticed that absolutely thrive are the ones that do this. They take the intelligence out of people's heads and they build it into a process to feed back or take feedback from their, their ERPs, the ordering, and, and then look at how do, they, how do they add more data to the mix and provide that guidance back into the game. On the customer side, they're, they're hungry for data. They want to be informed. They want to know what stock levels the suppliers have. They want to be able to do real-time you know, real ordering. They want drop shipment capabilities. Um, so we kind of split this intelligence framework and, and the system is in the middle, but the procurement intelligence has to be a people-led process. And it's very important that um, organizations don't look at something like connected commerce and go, okay, great. You know, I, I, don't, I then don't need 10 people. Uh, the answer is actually the opposite. Your organization will thrive because from those previous graphs that I showed you, there's so much under serviced customers already in, in various companies. And, and, you know, and it's probably half the, the effort of a business is sales and promotion. And if that effort can be targeted, that intelligence applied, then you, you can create a very powerful um, structure. Now, what we know when that goes into play is the customers get the information on demand when they want it. And that's really powerful. That increases sales. There's no doubt about it. And on the flip side, the procurement people are far more empowered on their side because they actually feel that they're totally uh, managing the game. That they're, that they're assigned to do. So, uh, so those three elements is what really underpins connected commerce. So question, what is your relationship to your product data? Is it highly critical? Is it um, you know, useful? Is it an afterthought? Is it still in people's heads? Um, and you know, <laughs> maybe from this presentation, you've suddenly had a thought, maybe we do need that catalog data. So have a think about that um, and we look forward to seeing what you say. There must be a lot of great thinking going on. Um, great, that's good. I'm, I'm really pleased to see that. Highly critical, very useful and afterthought. And, and the it's in our people's heads, the, that's a great, that's the great opportunity here is that it's to work out how to get it out of their heads. Well, connected, connected commerce will drive that. Online ordering and e-commerce does drive that to a certain degree. Um, but this next step really drives it because again, we're getting towards 100% procurement automation. 
All right, so the future, this is the bit that I love. This is where I spend most of my time. Let's kind of go back a step. Let's take a connected commerce platform. Now in 2006, I had to come up with a name that was iconic because I was like, well, we're gonna build this and uh, it's gonna be kind of a universal marketplace level platform. I needed a name. So we called, it took a year, we figured out the name squiz.com. Then we needed to nut out um, a structure so that we could get organization entities securely able to, to, to join this platform. And when I say securely, this, the, I mean, security is, is such a broad topic. But what I mean by that is how do we create it so that organizations can set themselves up, but at the same time, they are protected and even from our own team. So we created a connector framework. So um, uh, now the connector framework is the black dots and we'll, we'll fill that in a second. And then eventually, and then we needed organizations to be able to create themselves and then bring their people in because without the people and the, the, the connected relationships between people, you can't really do any connected commerce. So this is, this ultimately is, a, is what we call, and sorry for the tech terms, but it's called a socially encrypted graph architecture. And it's different to Facebook and Twitter and so on because it's encrypted by nature. So when you sign up on Squeeze, when you create your organization, you get these encryption vaults that are assigned to those entities that even us at Squeeze, we can't get into or hack unless we're connected to your organization. All right. Now we had to come up with some software. So we couldn't wait for the software vendors, the ERPs out there to, or the accounting systems out there to sort of bolt their systems in, but we wanted them to have the ability to do that. So we created an open API, uh, we've, we've released that, there's, there's libraries they can download. But we've also created another really powerful piece of software we called the connector. Any organization can download our connector, they can set up an adapter and, and link it to their organization in Squiz. So through that, then organizations can start building connected trading relationships and linking debtors and creditors together through a trusted uh, framework. All right. So one of one such client of ours that had, that was you know one of the really early adopters and it's just such a pleasure to mention them is Q Imaging. They have now got several uh, key clients of theirs that are now bolted into uh, this framework, and they have websites that are now synchronizing product catalog data, pricing their their websites are now submitting orders to Q Imaging via uh, Squiz. And some of their customers have their own systems that are just bolted in. Uh, so now we're, you know, these guys are now in a sort of a, a heading in towards a mature stage for their build out of connected commerce. Now, as they do that, what will happen through the, just the general network effect is that broadly more marketplaces will start to come online. And next year we start our work on, on creating a ability in Squiz to stand up marketplaces. So it's a very exciting thing because marketplaces really starts then tapping into tendering, uh, you know, being able to release tenders to direct marketplaces that can be virtually priced in real time um, and then checked off through connected commerce workflows. Um, but marketplaces broadly could be uh, shopping malls, they could be uh, such bigger entities. And there's lots of crossover as different marketplaces stand up that'll create, that'll create interlocking demand for connected commerce and, and the thing um, grows out. So now uh, time is now to get into this and um, we wanted to get rid of all barriers. So you can sign up to the, this platform right now. You can register uh, your organization. Um, I, I also, you can connect with me. That's my invite code. So in Squiz, we wanted a code that everyone had. It's like a unique business card code. You can put it on your business card. I have it on mine. Um, you can put it in your email signature and that code you can connect and the other person has to approve the connection. You can't just connect. It's not like a WhatsApp thing. It absolutely makes sure that both people are connected. So this, this gets rid of spam. Um, Create, there's a register organization button there. Register your organization takes two minutes. Once your organization's in platform uh, set up, then you'll have a vault and in your organizations tab, you can click into your organization profile. Okay, connect with someone else. So in the contacts tab, you can go add contact, um, put someone's email, they'll get an email. You could put their invitation code if they're already on the platform um, and you can assign them to different contact groups as well. So connect with someone else. But broadly, what, I, what, I, what I'm really here saying is that um, 
there's been a it's pulling this this off is is probably one of the most challenging and difficult uh, in computer science engineering feats and uh, we're 15 years into it and it's really starting to build out now um, but it's it as much as it's taken a, a great team of us to bring this to you uh, what we really want is for you to really go okay so if this is in play how could this revolutionize what we're doing how could this make things more efficient how could we unlock uh, that procurement intelligence? How can we put that into action? So naturally, the more I've spoken to different industries, there's lots of different types of use cases for this that have emerged. And we're always interested in hearing those use cases, but the platform's there and, and you can connect organizations together and start trying things out. All right, so the future is naturally, when I started out in 2006, I wanted this kind of idea of this multi-supply shopping basket. Uh, it's in development right now and uh, you can actually log in when you sign up to the platform you can kind of see example shopping baskets there um, this development should have shopping baskets released by um, December uh, this year and um, but it will be a build out over the next year or two uh, but you can li you'll literally be able to go and add products to the shopping basket from different suppliers check out um, and there's a feature in the checkout process uh, that's really really important and this ties back to the workflow uh, just the next slide thanks Daniel oh, he's gone back with it well I'll just mention it um, in the checkout you can actually go post purchase order back into my system because if you're connected into into the the platform then then squiz can actually raise your purchase order and close the customer loop and then it posts the sales orders to the supplier. So there's a little switch in there that, that really, um, that will be liberating for quite a lot of people. And that's where we can get closer to 100% procurement automation. All right, so that's, um, that's a wrap. And I really appreciate, um, you know, you're listening so far. And I certainly look forward to answering some questions that come our way. Can't hear you, Sharon. I'm on mute. I need to. Uh, <laughs> I need to now donate to charity. That's the yep. first time it's happened on my webinar. Thank yeah. you, Glenn. What a great presentation. I, I think you had me at um, prevent us from being shackled to the digital world. Terrific. Yeah. And also, you know, what what can be um, what's fantastic is the ease of really filling your shopping basket from multiple suppliers. Mm. It makes sense to me. Yep. What we might yep. do is um, move to Q&A. And what I'm going to do is invite two more panellists to join us. Yep. So let me introduce you first to Rachel Marston, Head of Business Development at squiz.com. Rachel, welcome as you turn on your um, video. And Ben Woodward from his Global Marketing and Channel Manager at Smart Freight. Welcome, Ben. Rachel might go to you first just to tell us briefly about yourself and, um, then, we'll get, and then we'll go to Ben and get stuck into Q&A. Thanks, Sharon. Um, well, um, as you said, I'm Head of Business Development for um, Squiz. I joined Squiz um, about 18 months ago after about 25 years in the office products industry um, where I worked in uh, the procurement side of things and, and also the sales side of things. So, um, yep, I'm happy to be on board with Squiz and answer any, any questions um, any of the viewers throw our way. Thanks, Rachel. Ben? And hey guys, look, you don't want to hear a lot about me, but just Smart Freight. It's multi-carrier shipping software. If you produce products and need to get them out to your customers or other businesses, Smart Freight can put you in touch with hundreds of routes and services to save you time and money. And a little bit about Smart Freight and Squiz. We've been fully integrated with Squiz since its infancy and we've had a 15 plus year partnership with Glenn and the Squiz team. So any shipping solution questions, fire my way, but I'm looking forward to diving into the Q&A session with everyone. Great. Thanks, Ben. Okay, we'll stick a kick straight off. Uh, Cosmo has a question for, I'll put out to the panel. Why do you need a consignment and electronic slip? Uh, well, naturally, you, you want to be able to track goods in transit. So, um, a... Naturally, you can you can create a manual slip. I, mean, I think back to the old logistics days, uh, that's what they did. And Ben, you can probably you know 
we'll jump into that on that one. But from a squiz point of view, when an order is processed by the supplier, this we want to in real time at that point go, okay, where's it got to go to and get it priced and quoted and then raise the consignment with the target, the target carrier and smart freight can do that work uh, for the platform. So rather than squeeze having to, you know, integrate with 200 plus carriers, which is the work smart freight have done. We then, you know, literally route out that consignment request through smart freight. It works it out and spends back or sends back to squeeze what, you know, what the answer is and it allows Squiz to then raise that consignment. And then, then you can start getting into universal tracking. So Squiz can then provide abilities so that you can, you can raise, you can bring up the, the transaction and you go, okay, well, where is it? And you don't have to go then to different carrier tracking platforms to, uh, to find out. And we actually route the tracking requests through Smart Freight as well. Ben, and do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, Glenn. And so in the good old bad days, it was manual consignment notes. I think the key here is that everything is electronic. So the order comes from Squiz into Smart Freight. Smart Freight creates a consignment, but it's all electronic. We, the only thing that is manual is we produce a label, it has to go on the box, someone has to pick it up. But all that transactional data is held up in Squiz and Smart Freight is just the last mile labeling solution, but gives you that ability to um, automatically track through those electronic consignments. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Rayhan asks, um, I think this is a price uh, question. How can the customer ensure the pricing of goods is justified? Okay, so um, uh, Rachel, do you want to answer that one? Um, I'm I, not I, sure if I understand I, that one. <laughs> I think I think the question is how do how do you know what what's the price for the for that particular customer? Um, but maybe if it's not if I don't answer this correctly, feel free to qualify that question. Um, the way ERP systems or accounting systems store pricing is different for different platforms. But the the, the general can the general trend is that there's a multiple price levels for different groups of clients, and then um, then there's contracts that are for specific customers. And then there's other advanced pricing such as quantity break uh, discounts, um, discount matrices, category level discounts. And in fact, in, in our Totex world, uh, we have a client who has global discount breaks across their entire product range. So if you order over a box of 30 of these garments, it doesn't matter which ones they are, every price for every product that's in the garments category will drop. And, uh, and trigger a quantity break discount. So pricing can be extremely complicated and it's stored inside these ERP and accounting systems. And we've created, a, a designed the way through that universal connector to bring those prices at a customer relationship level in. And as soon as you anchor your customer account to that relationship, Squiz will pick, will, will run that pricing through that relationship, link to that customer account and mirror exactly what's going on in the supplier system. Uh, Cosma asks, does the system allow for auto catalog pricing updates? Yeah, and you can push that pricing every five minutes or 10 minutes, you know. Um, generally with pricing, it's mostly done daily. Uh, however, you can, you, you get to choose. You, the, the connector software we have has a built-in scheduler and you can schedule pricing to run, you know, daily. But uh, some clients have stock updates running every 15 minutes, but the connector can do two way communication. So Squeeze can actually do a live stock check if the supplier organization configures it to do that in real time when the customer adds to cart. Um, so there's a lot of power around uh, the way that the, the, the update synchronization works. Great, thank you. Um, Cosma, thank you for, keep, for asking these questions. Um, yep. Are we able to share with other customers as suppliers from Squiz for sourcing products we can't find, products we can't find? Yeah, and this is kind of the intention of marketplaces in the future. You'll be able to actually go, your organisation could be part of a marketplace that could have a whole bunch of suppliers um, in that marketplace and that you might throw up a, a, a marketplace level inquiry that anyone in that marketplace can answer and, and then offer you and say, look, we're, hey, we've got these products. Does that suit what you need? And then you'll be able to go and pick that product and import it into your own 
ERP system and, uh, and start selling it. Great. Uh, I've got a freight question here. Can the customers, yep. um, after placing their orders, use their freight forwarding company to ship their orders rather than you shipping it? And do you think when they use DT, DTD delivery, it will be cheaper? I'll let, let you handle that one, Ben. I'm not sure what DTD, but yes, um, in Squares, you could choose not to be connected to Smart Freight and you could be directly connected to a freight forwarder. Um, we can we have relationships with freight forwarders as well, but um, yes, and in the Squares world, that's called what's known as a forced order. You would determine exactly which carrier rather than using Smart Freight to choose perhaps the cheapest or the fastest option, but that is absolutely configurable and at your determination. Yeah, and it's, it, the way that happens in Squiz is there's a concept called order, order surcharge rules, and you can say, okay, for this condition, this is what happens. Uh, we want a smart freight to handle that. In this particular condition, you know, it's an international order, and we want that to go to directly through DHL. Yeah, door to door. Okay. Yeah, but just so everyone is clear, Squiz Squiz isn't a logistics company, so we we don't we don't um, move boxes. Great, thank you. And um, and yeah, that was clarified door to door. Yeah. Um, how are you going to get an entire supply chains on board with this? Yeah, that's the, that's the big uh, the big challenge. Um, first of all, creating awareness, and it's actually to cause the thought leaders of different industries to 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 think about how to apply this, and then let that messaging work its way through their industry. Case studies are great. Um, you know, any company that wants to really try this out, we're, we're interested in working with them and, and bringing that on. But in a broader sense, inside the, the Squiz technology, we, we haven't released it as yet, but it's, um, it's a feature that is just about ready. And we, we're just fine, fine tuning our sequencing of this so it's really user friendly. Um, but you basically, once you synchronize your customers and suppliers into your Squiz organization data vault, then you can invite those en masse if you want to. So the idea is that, you know, if you want to say to all your customers, hey, we're now on Squiz, we're now integrated and ready to go, you can, you'll be able to do that function. But, um, but you have to let Squiz do that function. It's not something that we will, we will do. Yeah, sure. Um, and we're getting we're almost run out of time, but I'll just give you ask one more question uh, across the panel. Yep. Um, what are some of the most common challenges to start the journey to connected commerce? Um, the common challenge is to think outside the current situation that your business is in, uh, because it might be just working okay. So, um, and everyone is doing, uh, you know, the normal, the, the the levels one, two, and three, and it might be okay. It's actually really to go, okay, where um, where are we, where are the gaps? Uh, where are we sort of, you know, where's the big opportunities for our business? And, and you know, the, the first thing is actually talk to your customers. They will actually have the answers. Uh, you know, we, we, oh yeah, we would love to have this. This would be great. Uh, that's generally what comes back. Sometimes customers go, oh geez, we don't know. We don't know if we're ready for that. Um, so the talking to customers is probably the best way to, to sort of see you know, where they're at in, in this journey and, uh, and start from there and get those customers on the platform, like just ring them up and say, well, set up your organization. We'll connect our organization to your organization and let's just sort of see how far we can go with this. Terrific. And I might just turn to each of the panelists and since we are running out of time and just for one yep. closing r remark, maybe starting with you, Ben. Uh, I guess, look, talking about the Squiz journey, it's about thinking outside the square and not just one-to-one -one relationships. It's one-to-many, but it's all about security and being connected. And if ever there was a time for this platform, it's right now. Thank you, Ben. Rachel? Yeah, and I think I can just follow on from what uh, Glenn just said. It's about opening your mind and not going, going into work day to day doing the same thing over and over groundhog day it's, it's mm -hmm. time for change and squeezes the platform that will will um will help that happen for your business thank you and final word from you glenn yeah probably the probably the point of this um some, sometimes the feedback we get from various people is that you know this is this is really this is a big game this is huge um and it is but our whole goal is that we don't replace 
the, the great things that other business software systems do is that we provide the glue. So that's our real intention here is that um, if we can bring systems together in this universal framework, then it's going to allow us to do just so much more different things smarter and uh, across different supply chains and broadly the economy. Um, and some of the work that I'm doing right now is in smart cities and, and that'll fire up in the next couple of years. Uh, you know, once we, once our cities can sort of know uh, that we're here and, but securely, then we'll be able to do so much more uh, around um, the, the anywhere economy that we're heading into. Terrific. Look, fantastic discussion, fantastic presentation. Thank you, uh, Rachel, Ben and Glenn for your time today. And many thanks for uh, squeeze.com for sponsoring today's webinar. Uh, yep. We have more Pleasure. webinars. We, terrific. Thanks, Glenn. We have more webinars coming up. I want you to put this one in your diary. This is going to be a ripper. Um, it's an, um, our branch ACT webinar and it's from cladding to chemicals, risk mitigation in the public sector. Now that's on Wednesday, the 9th of September next week. It's actually from 10, uh, 4 30 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time and 6.30 p.m. from New Zealand time. Um, so don't miss this one. We've got our own Duncan Brock um, fellow um, and Luke McLeod, who's an MSIPS, and they're going to speak on the role of procurement in risk mitigation in the public sector projects. Now, the webinar is really going to look at two case studies. Um, the purchasing decisions played a significant role in the devastating Grenfell Tower fire in 2017 in the UK. So um, Duncan will cover that. And Luke is going to give us a case study on the role of procurement has in defence-based contamination from the use of legacy firefighting foams and the approach to managing risk and impacts. So please join us um, and register for this webinar, go to um, our website, sips.org, or SIPS Australia and New Zealand LinkedIn page. And to all of you who attended today, we hope you found this uh, webinar insightful. Please, before you leave, do do our post webinar survey. We need your feedback to continually improve on our webinars. A copy of the webinar and a list of any unanswered questions will be emailed to you next week. Thanks again. Please keep safe and take care.